business to around half of their total business. The EBITDA and FI23, well, it surged due to higher margins in conventional, premium conductors, increase in cable volume, and also potential benefit of supply-demand imbalance, which led to a surge in exports. On a per-unit basis, the conductor business EBITDA per unit, that surged to around 44,000 rupees. That was aided by favorable market conditions post-COVID as customers, they paid a premium for reliable delivery. In the specialty oils and lubricants business, the EBITDA per KL came in at around 4,780 per KL. That was a little bit lower on a year-in-year -year basis. Well, the management has listed out the order book positions in both the conductor as well as cables business. They've also listed the key growth drivers for the company going ahead. Well, in FY23, the total interest outgo was around 300 crores, which effectively means the total debt is around 3,500 crores. This as per analyst estimates. Well, the stock trades at around 16 times trailing earnings, but the street believes in the next couple of years, well, we'll see consolidation of earnings because FY23 was a blockbuster year and may not get replicated. The key downside risks include continuous slowdown in the past sector, CAPEX, if at all, and rupee volatility as well. Well, before we wind down, let's run you through the shareholding pattern that should come up for you on the screen. But to understand the company in greater detail, well, let's go across to Mr. Kushal Desai, the Chairman and Managing Director of Apar Industries. Mr. Desai, thank you so much. Welcome to our office. Mr. Desai, you had a very, very good year. You know, FY23 was brilliant. The problem about having a good year is, for the next year, you know, recency bias will say, hey, you had such a good year, how is this one shaping up? So we're two months into the year, that's FY24. Right. Right. How are things panning out, both domestically as well as internationally? Are you seeing a fair bit of traction? So we are seeing traction. Um, obviously, the financial results have a profitability component, which was very, very high last year. There were a lot of tailwinds. Um, going forward, the, the key thing is the addressable markets which we are looking at. Mm. And what is driving growth for us, not only for this year, but for the next several years, is the addition of renewable energy. Right. And so as you have solar installations, wind installations that are taking place all over the world, and this is driven by commitments given on COP26, COP27 by governments. Right. And in developing countries uh, like India as well as China, you know, whether you call it, you know, it's like almost semi-developed in that sense. And then you have the United States, you have Europe, you have Australia. Yes. There's massive amounts of, uh, of new power sources going in. Okay. So you have a cable intensity which takes place within the generation area, right. in the substation. And then transmission lines come in as you evacuate power to get it to consumers. So okay. we are seeing across... And then for every substation, you have transformers. Okay, all right. You know, you mentioned China briefly out there. One of the beneficiaries of China being absolutely, you know, locked down or lack of supplies coming out of China would be our power industries, right? Because lower supply from there and people want better quality as well. Maybe that could be a potential uh, winner for you. So Tell us more about that because China is reopening now. Yes. So, Nigel, what's happened is that there is clearly a China plus one advantage that uh, a country like India has as people are looking for alternate sources of uh, supply, reliable supply. Um, and because Apar has been exporting products, people are familiar with utilities, EPC contractors over the last several decades. There are certain geographies where like the United States, Australia, where there is a very concerted effort to add suppliers who are not of Chinese yeah. Uh, origin. Okay. Um, and there are some tariffs like in the United States that are also helping in this uh, in this regard. Right. So there are some markets where we have a vantage position. Mm -hmm. There are other markets where actually the Chinese have a better situation because they have uh, MFAs and agreements in place right. where their duty structure is a little bit lower than ours. So now with things having pretty much uh, uh, come to normality, mm -hmm. even in China, the competitive intensity in some of these markets where there's a level playing field for China and India, it has increased. Well, Mr. Desai, let's focus on your business vertical-wise. And the right. largest part is the conductor's business, That's right? That's correct. So if you could tell us, you know, your focus has been on value addition. Over the last few years, the value addition component has gone on up drastically. Yes. And the tailwind for you has been the not-so-high value products have been finding demand in the export market. So how is the conductor business shaping up, if you could give us a sense out there, and also in terms of a volume growth? 
what are you targeting so, this year? So, uh, let me show you a product, Nigel. So, you know, these are uh, what are called uh, HTLS or high efficiency conductors. And the differentiation is that if you see the core here, it's a carbon composite core. Okay. The same sort of materials that are used in an aircraft oh. for the outer shell of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. And they, are, uh, they don't have a coefficient of linear expansion. So, when you carry a lot of more current, the conductor gets a lot hotter it can transmit significantly more power. So when you have urban concentrated centers like Mumbai, where power is growing every year, yes. right of way not available. Right. Um, these sort of conductors is what we have come up with. And we design a complete turnkey solution. So we sit with the utility, figure out what is the right conductor, utilize the existing frames which mm. are there, right. and the same right of way for delivering up to 200% more power. Oh. on the same line. And then if you see here, you know, these are copper conductors which are used. And they are used they, in? They are used in the railways. Okay. So if you see, India has had this massive electrification going on of the railways. It yes. was quite uh, uh, ironical that we were using, importing fuel and oil hmm. to move coal. Because oh. coal is also moved by trains. Right. So when the government moved towards a program of electrification, we became the largest uh, supplier of uh, these sort of copper cables uh, or, or copper conductors for the electrification of the lines. Okay, so you know I just wanted to understand in terms of the conductors business, what kind of a volume growth are you looking at? Last year you did around 160,000 uh, I think roughly. About a 10%, 10 to 15% growth, uh, 160,000 is what we did, we've given a guidance of getting to about 180,000. Okay. Tons this of this year. Year. And what kind of capacity do you have? Do you think since the market is growing at such a brisk pace, Will you have to add capacity? So we are going through a big uh, expansion in capex, mm -hmm. about 400 crores which will go in over about 18 months. Okay. Of which 100 crores is dedicated to conductors and rod capacities. Because you know, as you see, some of these higher value conductors are yes. all made out of aluminum alloys. Got it. And we have our own alloying technology. Right. And uh, so you know, this expansion allows us to increase capacity. It also increases fungibility. So depending upon the kind of demand that people have, or utilities and EPC contractors have, we can switch the product lines to meet uh, their requirements. And post this capex, what does your capacity go to in the conductor segment? It will go closer to about 200,000, but uh, uh, besides that, we, we will be able to produce a lot of high value conductors right. pretty much through all the plants. Okay, so in terms of value addition, I think you're around 45-50% approximately. So where do you see this number stabilizing? Value addition as a percentage of conductor sales and also EBITDA per unit. Last year was a dream year, you know, 44,000 Last year we had a whole lot of tailwinds. Yeah. The, years, the two years prior to that did have uh, headwinds, headwinds because of yeah. all the COVID related issues. But, you know, we've guided that about 25,000 a ton, you know, is what is a sustainable uh, level. Mm -hmm. um, if there are any specific tailwinds, it could be a bit uh, higher. Okay, you also spoke about the cables uh, business. You know, cables, you're more into industrial cables. That's yes. not so much into B2B. But you're also looking at growing that, uh, that part yeah, of your so business. Actually, we have, so you know, the, this wire that I'm holding mm -hmm. is a wire which is called Apar Anushakti wire. Yes. And if you see there, you know, we've got Sonu Sood, uh, you know, as the brand ambassador for those wires. The uniqueness of these wires is that they can carry up to 50% more current. Okay. So as of now, I understand that the cables business, the B2C part of it, that has grown from around 120, 130 crores to I think 175 crores approximately. Yes, cables and wires yes. business. So what is the outlook out there? Same From 100 we went to 175. Right. This year we are targeting 275 to 300. So just mathematically going by rate, maybe 20, 2027, 2028 we should be at 1000 crores? That's the aspiration, we are working towards that. Okay, alright. You know, you're, so you have told us a little bit about the wires and the uh, cables part of the business. We spoke about the conductors as well, but there's another element in there. Yeah, the lubricant side. Lubricant side, yeah. So, so for example, uh, let's see, we have... Uh, we have, you know, these two products, you know, this is Cruise and this is Icent. Mm -hmm. So we do the ENI brand for South Asia. So we have the license, we manufacture and distribute ENI branded products in India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, yeah. you know, this area. So Icent, for example, is a, a synthetic, it's a 100% synthetic product. Okay. Top of the line, you know, for high-end passenger cars. Right. Very low emission. Um, meeting all this new Bharat 6, Euro 6 standards, etc. Okay, so now in terms of this part of the business, you know, however you want to term it, I think as of last year, you did around 480,000 on the volume aspect. Yes, 480,000 kiloliters. So, yeah. where do you see that number headed? What kind of a volume growth are you looking at? And also, I think in terms of an EBITDA per KL, you know, you are in that vicinity of around 4,500. 
So I think we are, we are guiding about five to five and a half thousand because that's what we think is a level which you know is a sustainable level uh, that we can get to. Um, we see a growth of about five to seven percent. Well, you know, Mr. Desai, the power story here in India is looking up. And that will be good in terms of business for cables as well as conductors. But I right. understand that the US market as well is a big market. Tell us more about that. What is the size of the US market? How much do they import? And also, what is India's contribution out there? So, you know, it's all being driven by renewable energy, as I mentioned earlier. So today, the US is adding about 13 gigawatts of renewable energy a year. They're going to take it to 30 gigawatts in the next couple of years. Uh, from what I understand is that about $20 billion worth of cables were imported in the year 2021. Okay. Um, and of that, India has exported not even $500 million. Oh. Um, given the fact that we have uh, the relationships that India has with the US, you know, uh, our tariffs haven't changed relative to China, which is much higher. There's a big scope of actually moving product and selling into the US. Explain this to us. The interest cost that you're paying is around 300 crores. Yes. But you're not sitting on a big debt. I think acceptances are... I, I, so what I'm happens is, Nigel, you know, just let me spend a minute to explain that, you know, so we end up importing aluminum, base oils and, and, and many of our raw materials yeah. on extended credit terms, mm. you know, suppliers uh, credit. Uh, simply because the delivery cycle is a bit long. So mm. you manufacture and in many cases, you know, uh, customers want it on a DDP basis. So you have to deliver it to a site, you know, in the US or a warehouse in the US and then they pay you 30 days after the product has reached. Okay. So it enables us to, uh, to run the cash flow well. Um, the cost of interest is born into the, into the costing. Okay. Uh, many of our customers are EPC contractors and they also have a long cycle in terms of finally installing, getting paid on a milestone basis. Right. So often they end up opening 120 day, 180 day letters of credit on us. Okay. Usually you have 45 to 60 days which is interest free, that are normal credit terms. And post The that rest is. of it is interest bearing. Okay. So if you see about 4,000 crores of LCs which we have outstanding, against that you have about 2,000 crores worth of LCs that you have from your clients. Okay. So what gets captured in this 300 crores is the LC opening charges, interest, you know, various other bank charges, right, uh, and all of that. Okay, explain. So that. if you you can't directly correlate it to the amount of debt that the company has. You're right. All right. Then final question, Mr. Desai. You have three businesses. You're sounding pretty optimistic on all three. At some point of time, would you like to, you know, demerge it, keep them separate, or do you think they're all interlinked? Because that could unlock some so value. So let me, let me explain to you something in a very simple manner. Yeah. Uh, we see all of them being very synergistic. So, you know, we talked about renewable energy. You take a solar installation. So you have solar panels. You have wires or string cables that go around the panels. A cable that brings it to an inverter. Yeah. Then a cable that takes it from the inverter to the substation. Yes. The substation has transformer oil in it because the power is then stepped up for mm. transmission. Yes. Then you have a transmission line which has a conductor. It goes finally to a residential area, commercial area, etc. Again, you have a substation yeah. with transformer oil in it. And then you have wires and cables that bring it right up to the last mile. So you believe it's best the businesses so are kept together. Absolutely. And I think today with this, especially with this whole renewable energy, with the whole change in mobility. Yes. You know, we spoke earlier about, uh, you know, here's an award actually which Apar got from Siemens a global mobility award yeah. because we did the cabling uh, for the Ahmedabad Metro for which they actually gave us the Siemens was the EPC yeah. contractor for it. So again you've got electricity running there. Yeah. You know, we do transformer oil which goes into the traction transformers that run the locomotive. Yes. A lot of synergies in the business. So best kept together. Yes, absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to Thank you, Nigel. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, that was a deep dive into Apar Industries, but time to slip into a short break. We'll come back with another interesting stock. Dream Folks is in the spotlight on the other side of this very short break. Welcome back. You're still tuning inside out on CNBC TV 18. This is our SWAT.
Welcome back. You're still tuned in Inside Out on CNBC TV 18. This is our Swatlight segment. And with air travel coming back with a bang in India, I thought of looking at some of the segments or sectors which are ancillary to this sector. And with increasing usage of airport lounges, dream folks came on my radar. Listed in September 2022 with a 55% premium to its issue price of 326, the company is an airport service aggregator and provides airport-related services such as lounges, F&B, spas, meet and assist and nap rooms and hotels for transit. In FY22, company had 95-97% to share in the India-issued card-based access to domestic lounges and 68% market share of all the lounges in the country. Let's explain this via the domestic lounge market. Now, travellers can access lounges via loyalty program cards, which is around 5%. There would be digital or QR codes. 6% of them do walk-ins. Airline voucher is around 3% and rest do it via credit or debit cards, which is a whopping 82% of the total access market. Of this 82%, Dream folks has a market share of 95 to 97%. Now, let's understand the value chain of the lounge market. Dream folks would have three types of clients. One would be the credit card company itself, something like Rupee or Diners Club. Second would be the banks who are the card issuers, something like Axis Bank, Bank of Baroda, HDFC Bank, ICICI Bank. Then you would have the corporate clients. There would be Indigo, Ease My Trip, Club Mahindra, to name a few. Now these corporates, they tie up a Dream folks, where Dream folks issues cards or vouchers, gives app access to customers on clients' behalf. And this is via a hybrid model. And access is given to multiple services like lounge access, meet and assist and the others which are mentioned here. Now they have an asset light model with minimal incremental capex needed to be deployed by the company regularly. This allows for high operating leverage. The major cost would be employee cost of course, but that is around 4.9% of revenues on an average basis last few years. And technology costs are important as well, but they have been around 0.4% of the total revenues. Now a quick look at the financials. FY20 and FY21 revenues, they were hit by COVID. FY22 did see some recovery. And then there was a big jump in FY23 to 773 crore rupees. Margins too haven't gotten back to those levels of 18%, but they have been between 16 to 17% in the last two to three years. And they reported a loss in FY21, but this is after profits of 32 crores in FY20. From there, their profits have increased substantially, currently tracking 72 crores. But important to note, the revenue number, this is the deemed revenue that is the value of service they provide to the client, but the actual revenues, they are only the commissions they earn from clients. Hence, the important metric to look at is the gross profit earned per customer. That was at around 137 rupees in FY20, then it saw a fall to 129 rupees in FY21 and FY22, and in FY23 there was a big jump to 156 rupees. Whether they can continue this or not is the key to track. Now with every business, there are some risks as well. The revenues and profits for dream folks are dependent on air travel growth. If passengers reduce, this would hit their revenues. Also with rising fares, this number is key to track. There have also been talks of reductions in MDR rates, which is a rate charged by card issuing companies every transaction with a debit or credit card. If this is implemented, it could hamper dream folks profitability as their clients might reduce spends on cashbacks and promotional benefits on cards. So that is a possible risk. In terms of shareholding, promoters hold 67% stake, mutual funds at 7% and some notable AIFs and FPIs also hold stake in the stock. Okay, that was our Swatlight segment, but now we have run out of time on this episode of Inside Out. It's a goodbye from Nigel and I. But do write to us and tell us the companies you want us to discuss and you want to hear about, and we'll feature these on our show. Thanks a lot for watching.